thing. No. And you were we very... We had, actually, at your we? bookshop way back. You're right. You're yeah. absolutely right. Um, and the Nazarene, Nazarene Malik from The Guardian was on the same panel, and she hadn't done it before. So we were sort of saying, oh, my God, this is, how, how are we going to do this? But you were so brilliant. You, you made us feel completely at home. You came and talked to us before the show, and we were, we were very relaxed. And it was a really good panel. And, and we all let each other talk. And the audience wasn't that sort of baying audience that it sometimes yes, can be. Yes. And I really enjoyed the experience. Well, I'm glad. I mean, but the secret of Question Time, I thought, was the audience. I mean, saving your grace. Um, because it was the one chance when we were back in the sort of Victorian hustings where you had mm. a chance to talk to senior politicians. I mean, you weren't a politician. You were there as a commentator. But when you had cabinet minister there, they, I always said to the audience, you know, this is your, this is your program. It's not my program. It's not the panel's program. It's for you to quiz the people on the panel, and you must feel free to do it any way you want. I mean, I agree, an hour is, of course, brief for that, and we would take three or four topics or something. Sometimes we'd just take one when there was a big issue around uh, the Iraq War and 9-11 and those kind of things, but very often very often, the brevity w was, was an issue. Do you think sometimes it would have been better if they'd stuck with four panelists? Because it's now, now five, and some. I mean, this, the second time I was on, when uh, after you had left, well, there were six panelists. Six uh, is too many. And I, I calculated afterwards because yeah, the amount I, of time I, you had. I was a bit annoyed about that program, yeah. but and I only had, I got three minutes. Yeah. Now you could say, well, that's your fault. You should have intervened more. I think three minutes of Ian Dale probably a lot of people think, oh, that's plenty. Thank you. <laughs> no, anyway, I tell anyway you what, that's I tell all we've what, got what, time yeah. for. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, the reason we. It, it, we went from um, four to five was because BBC has uh, an obligation on question time to put on the main parties each week and the nationalist parties and the smaller parties. And that took up the four and uh, took up three, sorry, yeah. three. And that, that meant there was one fourth person who wasn't a politician. And we felt they were always sort of tail end Charlie. They got left out. We thought if we had two non-politicians... Mm -hmm it wouldn't be possible for the politicians to sideline the person who'd come from outside because they, you know, if it was just a journalist or a comedian or a playwright or a poet or whatever it was, they felt a bit outside the panel of, of four. But with five people, there were two of them there and they could make the running themselves as well. That was the idea. And it worked, actually. It did work. It became less narrowly Westminster politics. Um, what input did you have on the panels? In terms of choosing who should come, uh, very little myself. It was done by mm. I had a I had a series of really brilliant editors who were much savvier about politics than I am, and who talked all the time to the political parties and sort of decided who they'd have and had their battles with Number Ten. I mean, sometimes wonderful battles. We had, we had one. We had one. Um, Ken Clark, for some reason, was out of favour with Number Ten. He was, I think, he was Home Secretary or something, and. Um, they, they, they rang us up and said uh, on the day and said, I'm sorry, he's got flu, he can't come. And we had a standard, we had a standard uh, answer to that, which was, um, OK. And they would say, well, and we'll send you so-and-so. And we'd always say, no, no, number 10 never sends us somebody for question time. We'll ask John Redwood. That was our standard answer. <laughs> and that would have done it. That would have done it. <laughs> and, and on this occasion, we didn't ask John Redwood. We did ask a backbencher that number 10 didn't want. Three o'clock in the afternoon, Ken Clark rings up and says, I'm on my way. What time do you want me? We said, but you've got flu. And he said, well, nobody told me. <laughs> <laughs> and number 10 literally was trying to get him off the panel for some reason. But and he is, came and did it. It is interesting great. now. When you, when you look at the conservative politicians that appear on Question Time, they're generally not cabinet. Well, some of them are cabinet ministers, but more often than not, they aren't. And it seems as though they, they've just decided that... Um, they're not going to put cabinet ministers yes, up anymore. Yes, I think anymore. that's right. Which, I mean, from a, from a democracy point of view, quite that, agree. that is appalling, isn't it? I quite agree. I think that it's the, it's the malevolent influence of the image makers of politics as, who say there's nothing in it for you, you minister. You got into trouble for saying that once, didn't you? What's that? Back in the... I'm trying to remember. There's a story you tell in the book about um, uh, the influence of... The number 10 press secretary. Oh, the press secretaries, yes. Ex I remember the line, expensively hired yeah. press secretaries <laughs> whose job is to disguise the truth or something. Yeah. I said it in the full knowledge that my grandfather was the first press secretary ever. 
And Which I was, didn't know. I thought yeah, it was fascinating. For, for David Lloyd George. Yeah. And he was, the Times said, this is a, this is a dangerous route, this press secretary route, because we want to hear from the prime minister. Um, yeah, I did get in trouble for that. But, you know, we know what press secretaries are like. I mean, we've got experience of them now. Um, in, in I'm, I'm not saying they, uh, let's get rid of the calumny. I'm not saying they lie. Just, just in case the lawyers are out there listening. I'm, I'm, I'm sure they're not. No, no, I'm sure they're not. But I mean, it's not. It's not that the. Um, it, I, that, that was when Nixon came to see Wilson. It was years and years ago, and uh, they were going into secret talks, and I was just being a bit tongue in the cheek. Uh, and you were doing this sort of commentary on Nixon. What was it? Arriving at the airport, or leaving at the airport, or something yes, like that. Yes. And, and I mean, obviously. Doing a commentary like that or on a state occasion, royal funeral, royal wedding, whatever, that is a very different type of broadcasting to presenting Panorama or yes. sort of presenting an election night. Yes. When did you first realise that you were actually rather good at doing these sort of state occasions? Well, I don't. I, I, that's a nice way of putting it. I mean, I when I began doing them, I did do commentary on political events and then I felt freer to be a bit cheeky mm. and to mock them a bit. Which does come through in the book, I have to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Nixon arriving with the Union Jack upside down on his car, which is a sign of distress in the Navy, you know, if you hang the Union flag upside down. Anyway, so and then I, then I began doing uh, Trooping the Colour and the State Opening of Parliament. And I then got, began to get the hang of what I'd call commentary that holds back from the event. So you let the pictures tell the story. And I enjoyed, I love doing those. And I mean, I've done, well, I st still do the Cenotaph each year, yeah. um, which is a, you know, very moving public event. And it's not your job to comment on it or do anything other than sit beside the person on the sofa watching the television and occasionally saying, this is what's happening now, this is what's happening now. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting, I wouldn't call it an art, it's an interesting skill that you learn and hone, and I love doing it. It's, it's a lot of work to get the words right. It's very difficult, you know, not to emote too much or mm. to over-egg things, just to keep quite quiet. And also not to repeat too much, because I, the only time I've had to do this was when the Queen's coffin was coming back from North Holt to Buckingham Palace, and I had the TV screens in front of me here, and I could see where they were, and our reporter was at Buckingham Palace, and I then had to commentate probably for about five minutes on the progress of this. And I was thinking, oh, my God, I don't know if I can do this. But it was, it was quite exhilarating in a way because in the end I, felt, I found that I could do it. And I wasn't repeating myself every sort of 30 seconds and sort of saying something inane. And, but was it, this on television? No, no, this was sitting oh, here on in, radio. The, in this studio. Yes. Because on radio, you, ah. you, you, you've got, you really have got to describe the that pictures. That I find, I've, I've, only, I only, I've never actually done a live radio commentary. I was tried out uh, it, when I was very young on the Lord Mayor's show, and I was so bad they never asked me back. <laughs> So I like the pictures because you can shut up <laughs> well, it, <laughs> and but, let the pictures tell but, the story. But you have to basically assume that nobody can see the pictures. Now, there will be people at home with their televisions on probably, but, but listening to the radio. But a lot of people will be driving. So you've got to try and describe it in a way that they can they can picture it in their own mind. And so you talked for five minutes about... Yeah, the, which the, doesn't sound very long. It's but a actually, long time. It is a no, long no, time. it's a long time. Yeah. It's a long time. Right. Well, well, we'll I admire that skill. Well, we'll talk more about uh, all sorts of different things in broadcasting in a minute, particularly one or two times where you annoyed the BBC, because that, that's always quite entertaining, isn't it? Um, when the BBC annoyed me or well, I annoyed actually, them? probably that, yeah. <laughs> it's 18 minutes past eight. This is LBC. Join me.
on LBC. 21 minutes past eight. David Dimbleby is with me. We'll come to your calls in about 10 minutes' time. Um, we've got a couple of texts here first. I like this one from Mark in Liverpool. In the past week, David Dimbleby has been interviewed by two LBC heavyweights. After listening to their opening sentences, who do we all think David Dimbleby thought was the most fawning? Who is the teacher's pet? <laughs> <laughs> by that, I presume you're on Andrew Marr. No. Oh, who else have you been on? Um, James O'Brien. James O'Brien. Oh, yeah. Well, do you, want, neither do, you want, do you want to compare and contrast? No, certainly not. <laughs> Very dangerous. <laughs> Quite. And um, Will in Paris says, David had a tattoo on his back, a scorpion. Please ask him why did he choose a scorpion? You were 75 when you got your first tattoo. What on earth were you thinking? It was, uh, it was for a film I was making about sailing the seas. And we were doing, a, I was sailing around the coast of Britain talking about the history of Britain and the sea. And we were doing a thing about Captain Cook and it came up about tattoos. And I went to a tattoo parlour in Plymouth where there were Marines getting tattooed right up to their necks and down to the thing. And they said, would you have one? I said, no, ridiculous, no, I won't. When we came to the edit, I thought it looked so limp, me saying, no, I won't have one, that this was three months later. I went to a tattoo <laughs> parlour in East London and had a scorpion, which is my birth sign. There was only one mistake made with it. I can't see it because it's on my, my right mm. shoulder but out of sight. But it only has six legs. And I realised afterwards, t I think scorpions have eight. Well, we do have the cameras on if you'd like to display <laughs> no, it. No, but... I think I will <laughs> refrain from that. Actually, I should say you can watch us on Global Player. I should have said that right at the beginning of the uh, hour. Um, let's talk about your career at the BBC because um, in inevitably with the, the length of time that you were there, there were incidents where you maybe displeased them and they certainly displeased you. Do, do all presenters, do you think, have a bit of a love-hate relationship with the BBC? That, um, and some, sometimes no, it's quite I, a difficult No, I have a love-love relationship with the BBC in truth. But I mean, there are times when things go awry because it's... It, it, it's you know, you're dealing with controversial subjects and there'll be arguments about whether you've done things the right way or not. And um, you get, you know, you fight your corner. I mean, I can't, I can't actually think of... Moment. Oh, yes, I can think of moments. There was that Nixon moment. There was an interview I did with Harold Wilson called... Yes, a film I made called mm. Yesterday's Men about Labour in opposition where the governors of the BBC looked at the film and took things out. And that made me cross because the governors of the BBC or now the... Mm whatever it's called now, the board of the BBC, don't have any... It's not their job to edit films, you know. That, that's their job to say that film was rubbish or shouldn't have been shown yeah. if they want to. So I had those kind of rows. Um, but on the whole, no. I, and they tried to sack me from Question Time after about, I don't know... I, well, they, they took... I was taken out to a very expensive lunch, which is what, the, <laughs> you know, the way you get sacked, you know. Very suspiciously expensive lunch, and then that, that doesn't happen in commercial radio. Does by it the way. not? No, you no, don't get taken out for lunch. You just get shown. You just get shown the door, yeah. <laughs> and um, and they said we 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 think it's time you stopped because they thought. When was this? Oh, it was twelve years before I finished. Actually, it was way back, and uh, the, because they had a policy of, they thought that they wanted a younger audience for Question Time. What they hadn't realised was Question Time had, and I suspect still does have more young people mm. watching political a, a political program than any other political program on radio or television. It's very popular with young people. And I'm always meeting people who say they learnt all their politics from Question Time. That's what excited them about Question Time and all that. So it wasn't to do with me, but they thought a younger presenter would be good. Anyway, a new director general came in and there was an award ceremony. I remember it very well. I was being given a little silver plate media society, I think. And the incoming director general made a very nice speech about me, and I said, thank you very much, that's very sweet of you, but I'd want you to know that man over there has just sacked me. <laughs> and he said, oh, well, um, you better come out to lunch. So this was lunch number two. So a fortnight later, I had my second lunch, and he said, um, you can do it as long as you want. Go on as long as you want. So I went on for 25 years in all, and then thought, actually, I'm not going to tempt fate. I'll stop before I'm stopped. Seems to me a good recipe. I mean, d did you feel that you were still enjoying it as much as you did? Before? Yes, absolutely. Yes, but I, yes, I did. Um, I did, but I, 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 I thought you got a bit frustrated towards the end yes. with some of the, the 
the panels that I just didn't think were up to... Obviously not the one I was on, but well, didn't no, no, think, you, didn't think were quite up to scratch. We, I tell you what, we did begin to lose the big hitters, and that did... I mean, when I began, we'd have... You know, you'd have Ken Clark, Michael Heseltine, mm. Tony Benn, uh, Shirley Williams, that sort of calibre of politician. And when I say calibre, it's nothing to do with their opinions. They were people yeah. who understood Big how beasts. to argue and who didn't mind being attacked by the audience. They're perfectly capable of coping. And you got into a kind of more protective mode as the time went on. Again, I blame the whole PR mechanism and I blame social media. Because people get so monstered by social media if mm. they say anything controversial, put a foot wrong, you mm. know, that I think they, they just thought this is a storm I can do without. You know, if I can go on being the secretary for agriculture and not have to face this, uh, I will. I, why should I go on question time? What's in it for me? That's the dangerous question, you see. Politicians say, what's in it for me to do that? My answer is it's not in it for you. It's in it for democracy. It's in it for politics. But it's the same as politicians taking part in, in leaders' debates, isn't it? Where yes. I would have thought that was just something you do if you're leader of a political party. OK, you can haggle over the terms of the debate, but actually you should always do it. But that doesn't seem to be the case nowadays. I think leaders' debates are not all they're cracked up to be myself, actually. I think the, the better forum is the long interview with the leaders, which even that then mm. they're refusing to do. Boris Johnson wouldn't mm. do it. Uh, Liz Truss, in this run-up to her, um, cam in her campaign, wouldn't do it. Uh, it is, it is difficult. I mean, yes, I think politicians have a have a duty to go out there and and talk and explain what they're up to. Do, do you think that the caliber of politicians nowadays in, in 2022 is not what it was in 1982? I don't know. Do, what do you think? Well, I, I think. I think the problem is that people who say that are sort of my age and, uh, and above sound like old gits when we say that yeah. because, it, oh, it's not like it was in my day. Yeah. But then I'm sure in 1982, people would say, well, it's not like it was in Harold Macmillan's day. They did. Yeah, it, exactly. It was that thing about um, people who fought in the war. Yeah. You know, they've got their military cross for bravery on the beaches and they're a different kind of person, a different caliber of person. Uh, whether that makes you a better politician, I mean, you look at the politics of, well, you think of the Suez invasion, Anthony Eden, they were lying through their teeth about what they were doing mm. in a way that nowadays we'd all be on them for lying through their teeth. In those days, it kind of took ages to get out that that had happened. Do you, do you think 24-hour news channels are also partly to blame for the fact that um, maybe... Uh, I mean, cause they all have to fill their schedules with, yes. with interviews, yes. often very some quite short interviews, and... A prime ministerial interview, I always think, should have a sense of occasion about it. Do you think David Cameron would be in front of a camera, as would Tony Blair? I mean, they were, they were commenting on the death of, um, was it Shamir in Coronation Street or something? And you think, is that really what a prime minister is supposed to do? So how do you break this? Because you can't get rid of 24-hour news and radio. More and more radio stations, more and more television stations. You can't get rid of social media. So what can you do to keep the... Um, debate about political issues, serious and alive and interesting. So you're interviewing me now. Yeah, that's not what it's supposed to be like. Well, you're 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 the interviewer, so you you know the answer to these things because you do the political well, interview. I do know the answer, but I'd rather hear it from you. Well, I think that <laughs> I think that the trouble is that it, it you, you've got to be you. I was going to say balls of steel. You've got to be you've got to be pretty tough to be a politician in the first place and then when you get into high higher positions in shadow cabinet or in cabinet to go on realizing that you you must not be over cautious about your reputation or what you say you've got to be bold enough to speak your mind and see it as an obligation to do that and you've got to be bold enough to stand up to the people who tell you that you can't go on a particular program absolutely i mean i had an incident i won't say the name but a couple of weeks ago where we had booked not a cabinet minister, but a, a, a good, somebody I like interviewing. Um, and uh, this person was pulled from the programme on the basis that they might say something that would be wrong. I'm thinking, hang on, you are the minister. You decide whether you go on a programme. Yes. You can take advice, yes. but you're the one that makes these decisions. Yes, yes. And, and this was a minister, was, it was a serving minister, minister. Yeah. cabinet minister. No, 
minister, junior minister, junior minister yes. But what a prominent one. But the, yes, but the image makers are... You see, a lot of the image makers are trained in a completely different... They're not interested. They're not... I don't know, this is rude, because a lot of them go into it because they love politics. But I think very often their, their take on politics is simply to protect their, their minister, their boss. Mm. And actually to forget that what you talk about coming and talking to you or talking to me is part of the job. It's just always terribly sensitive. And I th I, perhaps because they think they'll get the blame if it goes wrong. You know, they didn't. Why didn't you warn me? Why didn't you warn me what that Ian Dale would say? You know. Well, we all know what Ian Dale will say if we if we're canny. So predictable. Uh, no, it's so dangerous. Election nights. Yes. Um, I just think that's the best job in television. You're right. I you think you it, well, clearly loved every I, single one of them. Yes, I did. I did. Um, why? Theatre, I think. Wonderful theatre. And in the BBC, brilliant sets, just yeah. excitement at brilliant, five brilliant to ten. Brilliant intro music as well. Da 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 I can't remember it. And then walking up the steps and then Big Ben striking and then the result of our exit poll is, which I always hated the exit poll because it gives the game away. I'd rather just start. And then these vast studios and in the run up to them, when you're preparing for this, you do two or three full rehearsals of elections. One with you know, Labour winning, one with the Tories winning, one with the hung parliament was what we always used to do, you mm. know. Sometimes it was a little bit um, too, too much of a fiction to think one way or the other, but that's how we did them. And then the excitement of the, of the actual participants, the politicians, the MPs coming in straight away and starting to defend their corner and say what's gone wrong. And they're all much more open. That's the other exciting thing on mm. election night. Everybody speaks... Well, they speak more of the truth than they certainly would during the election campaign. But I, I loved that. They were just glamorous, I think. I love that. I mean, How I, much I notice did you personally get of the exit polls? Um, about 10 minutes, literally, Is because that... they kept it very secret. They always keep it very secret because if it leaks out, anyone who picks it up, you know, the message can make a fortune by ringing Ladbrokes and p placing well, a bet on um, the majority, you know. I, I presented four election night programmes here and I don't get any notice of the exit Of the poll. poll, no. What I have to watch is you on the screen telling me what it's it is. It's 10 o'clock. And, then, and I, can... then I have to react to it and interpret it with no notice whatsoever. And I remember, I think it was 2017, when um, obviously it was the sort of hung parliament, Theresa May lost her majority. And I got two minutes before we went on air, my phone went and it was David Davis. And, and he I, said... I, and I just said, I've got two minutes. He said, ignore the opinion poll, the exit poll, it's wrong, and then put the phone down. No. I was thinking, what does that mean? And, <laughs> and what did it mean? I can't remember what happened then. Well, because well, the, the exit poll did show a, a hung parliament, hung so parliament. it was actually right, so he yes. was completely wrong. Anyway, I'm being told by my producer I have to go to the news. I'd happily continue without going to the news, but um, Andy Ivey wouldn't be very pleased with me. It's 8.34. Let's get the news headlines from Andy Ivey. The Chancellor insists he's totally focused on delivering tax-cutting plans aimed at increasing UK economic growth. But pressure is growing for a U-turn or measures in last month's mini-budget that have led to turmoil on the markets. A man who admitted shooting dead 17 people at a high school in Florida in 2018 will be sentenced to life in prison without parole. The jury could not unanimously agree Nicholas Cruz should be executed following a three-month trial. A charity is warning more lives will be lost if extreme delays continue in care for heart patients. The British Heart Foundation says average ambulance waiting times for Category 2 calls, which include suspected heart attacks and strokes, rose in September to 48 minutes. That's two and a half times the target of 18 minutes. LBC weather tonight, showers in central and northern areas of the UK, a few showers in the south. Tomorrow, mostly dry but cloudy with a chance of showers, sunny spells later in the day and a high of 17 degrees. This is LBC. Join me.
LBC with Ian Dale. Call 0345 6060 973. And we're talking to David Dimbleby about his book, Keep Talking, A Broadcasting Life. Now, there are so many things that I haven't asked David over the past uh, 30, 40 minutes. So it's up to you now. 0345 6060 973. Dale is in Luton. Hello, Dale. Hi, yeah. Um, it's a pleasure to speak to, get to speak to David. Um, I'm honest. So um, I was going to ask him, um, has have David, have you um, had any gobsmack moments when you've done presenting? I say that. And I remember watching the EU referendum and you did the announcement in the early hours and then, and then you then said Brexit, the tears of one, and you just come across very gobsmacked that moment, just absolutely stunned. Would that be one of the moments? Or? Well, it was gobsmacking because it was a big decision, but I, I was wrongly said by people afterwards to have been uh, showing my intense disappointment at the decision, <laughs> which I wasn't at all. I was, I was, it was... 20 to 5 in the morning, I think, and I, we'd been going at it since 10 o'clock. And um, I just felt there had to be some big statement. This was a big moment in British life. And I suddenly, and, and I kept saying to the BBC producer, when can we announce it? When can we announce it? And the BBC, very careful never to say a thing is, has happened until it actually has happened. It's not enough to know that the other side can't win now because there's no, you know, the, the, all the figures are going the wrong way for them. So when they said you can announce it, uh, with, when John Curtis, I think, said, right, we're now past the point when it's possible for the Remain side to win, we can announce it. And I thought, I must say something. I can't just say, so that's it, uh, you know. And I, I remembered I'd done the referendum in 75 when Harold Wilson had the vote on going into the common market, endorsing staying, the decision to staying, stay in the common yeah. market, yes. And so I used that. The, de the, the decision was made in 1975, it's been reversed, and that's it. We're out. And it sort of hit YouTube immediately. I don't know why quite, but it was a big moment, yes. And there are big moments, and you do have to make something of them because they're turning points, you know. And the big victories, Blair's victory, Thatcher's victory, those sort of moments... You do, you do, um, you do feel you're at a sort of turning point in history. And you can't just sit there and say, "Oh, so that's it." So Margaret Thatcher's won, and, you know, Tony Blair's won with the landslide. It's th th these are these are big events. What What's the biggest moment of your broadcasting career? Oh, don't, Ian. Oh, God, we've got to ask that question. Um, it's a predictable one, I, isn't I it? really can't think. I mean, biggest moment. I, I, you, you I mean, there's so, this. There's so many that there aren't. I, I don't think I've had many troughs. There are peak moments, but they're strange things, like um, interviewing Nelson Mandela, for instance, the day after he came out of jail. That mm. that stick in your mind, or um, always interviewing Margaret Thatcher was always a big moment, you know, because she was a very tenacious interviewee, and she, you know, she. She knew knew her stuff and would enjoy the argument. Did she have any small argument. talk before and after? Um, flattery. She used to say, "What a lovely tie," that sort of thing. And then after, I do remember once afterwards, we, she d just dismantled the National Health Service or something. Said there'd be a review, and we went up. She said, "Would you like a whiskey?" She always said, "Would you like a whiskey?" We went upstairs to her study, and I remember she said um, she started going through again all the figures on the National Health Service and why this part of the country wasn't as good as that. And, in, and kind of having had a lot of that stop her, I said, oh, could I, could, Prime Minister, do you think I could just ring my wife and see how it went? And she said, yes, David, of course. Aren't we all lucky to have one? <laughs> <laughs> it's such a good reply. Dale, thank you for that. Um, let's do a text question from Richie in Colchester, who says, can you please ask David if he feels Nick Griffin was a worthy guest on Question Time? The answer is absolutely yes, and I'd fought for him to be on long before actually the BBC agreed to have him on, and they agreed when he won seats in the European Parliament. But the BNP was gaining ground, and I thought it was, I believe, in you know the oxygen of publicity actually revealing people as they are, and that he should be subjected to cross-questioning. And we did a lot of work on that program to make sure that we didn't just sort of blandly talk about, uh, you know, the issues of the day. I remember afterwards he complained that we hadn't discussed the rise in postal prices. You know, po the post office just put up their prices. And uh, I said, well, you know, the, the, actually we're here to talk about race and the BNP. And, uh, I, and I 
we did a lot of research and I discovered this letter that he'd written to the Ku Klux Klan in America saying, we're moderating our position now, but once we gain power, we will drive people of color out of this country. And, I, you know, that, that was a real, I, I wanted to say that to him on air and say, what do you make, you know, why mm. did you say that? Is that your policy? So I've, I've absolutely defended the, the, the decision to have him on uh, though it caused a terrific storm. Well, he was an um, elected representative, wasn't he, for the, yes, he in, was. in the European Parliament? But there's another point, too, that I, th- I think that um, if, there's a, if, if what you say is not unlawful, uh, if there's not a law against it, it was the point the Director General at the time made, if it's, not a, if it's not unlawful to say the things or think the things that he was doing, then the BBC has a duty, really, to let it be aired, and that's a good thing. But were you uh, surprised by the reaction to it, though? Because you did this three-part documentary on the, on the BBC yes, recently. It was yes. a fascinating viewing, and the, and the section on this I thought was gripping because I, I didn't realise there were sort of all these riots outside Nor TV did I. centre. Nor did I. We were, we, there were big riots outside, and it wasn't until I made these films this year uh, that, I, that I saw the film of what was going on outside. Um, I mean, all I remember, we were in the studio, we were in the office, that's right, preparing to go to the studio, and suddenly we were all locked in and told not to leave our rooms, you know, mm. and you could hear voices in the corridors, people hurtling around. They, I, I wrongly, I was told later that they were trying to kidnap me, which would have been very pointless. The idea was <laughs> if they kidnapped me, there wouldn't be a programme. But I, th- I don't know what they were planning to do. Uh, but I talked to the people involved in that, and um, you know they're absolutely right. They objected, and so they, you know, they they made their demonstration. They made their voices heard. Uh, I, I think that's equally right. But I think it was right that Griffin was heard too. Right, we'll come back to more of your calls to David Dimbleby in just a moment. It's eight forty-five. LBC, Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player. Poor is in open revolt against PM. Conservative MP and Foreign Secretary James Cleverly, can you give us the background to this? During the time that she was running for the party leadership, she made it clear that she was going to reduce the tax burden on people and businesses in the UK. I don't it's, recall her saying been... she'd tank the economy, Foreign Secretary. I must have been out that day. The point is, Nick, our growth is outperforming a number of our international competitors. We are facing global economic headwinds. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. With Motorway, where dealers compete to give you their best price for your car. LBC.
Britain's Conversation. Ian Dale, tweet at LBC. 849, we're talking to David Dimbleby about his book, Keep Talking, A Broadcasting Life. Let's go to Michael in Pontefract. Hello, Michael. Hello, Ian. It's good to talk to you again, sir. Um, and it's quite nice to talk to Mr Dimbleby. I can't quite nice. say it. Sorry, I can't. <laughs> it's quite, no, quite, quite an honour. <laughs> um, my question was, leading on from the Nick Griffin conversation, um, do, do you feel that appearances like his on Question Time were a kind of watershed moment in the political discourse in this country whereby the more extreme positions began to seep into the mainstream consciousness? Well, uh, uh, that's interesting, Michael. I mean, my, my feeling is that certainly Nick Griffin... Uh, his reputation was diminished by his performance on Question Time, and the BNP pretty well collapsed as a party. So I think that you never know, really. I mean, you can't tell, but I think on that occasion, I don't know what you felt, but I think on that occasion, he was revealed to be somebody who was, in a strange way, hadn't really thought through what he was saying and couldn't defend his positions. And, uh, you know, the, the, he, he sort of fell apart by being on the programme. I mean, of course, the difficult question is, what if he hadn't? What if he'd actually been very persuasive and convincing? And then, you know, I, uh, that, that's the risk you take. What, what about the fact that I mean, the programme got quite a lot of criticism for the amount of times Nigel Farage was invited onto the Oh, panel. yes, yes. Um, yeah. Uh, he wasn't on as often as Ken Clark, I don't think. But or a, as Shirley Williams. A lot of people or think, as well, Tony Benn, if, I think, if he hadn't had that kind of exposure, would Brexit have happened? I'm not blaming you for Brexit, David, but... Uh... Thank you very much, <laughs> um, one way or another. Um, I, I, the, Nigel Farage is, is an interesting case. Um, first of all, um, I don't think we created Nigel Farage on Question Time, but once UKIP was emerging... Uh, it became part of the BBC's, once they were in, you know, it was big in the European Parliament, mm. part of the BBC's remit to put UKIP on. And I think the truth is that he was the, I won't say the only, because there were one or two other quite good speakers, but he was the best speaker. So when their turn came around, when the wheel came around, oh, we've got to have UKIP, you got to have UKIP on again, because we've got to have them on once every six weeks or whatever it mm. was. Well, I can't remember the exact figures. Um, Farage was the natural person to bring on. And, of course, he was a good debater. Well, he was, he was box office, wasn't he? He was box office, yeah. yes. But it's interesting, when the um, campaign, remember, uh, uh, was on, he was ostracised, he was thrown out. The, the Leave campaign would have nothing to do with Farage. Mm. He was sidelined. So I think, the I think the decision about Brexit was a much more profound and complicated decision than Nigel Farage's victory. Of course, Nigel Farage would say it was his victory. Uh, and, you know, on the issue of immigration, maybe he did, he did um, change people's views. But I think the arguments about Brexit will be seen with hindsight to be far more complicated than just the simple thing of there was this fellow called Farage mm. who won the whole country over to the idea of leaving the EU. I think that's not how it was. Um, Imran says, abolish all future cross-question episodes. That's my version of any questions. From here on in, 8 to 9 p.m. on LBC should be the Dimbleby hour. Oh, so there you wouldn't are. like that, Ian. Oh, I'd, 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 happ I'd happily <laughs> co-present with you for, a, for an hour each night, but uh, I suspect you've got uh, better things to Thank do. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, right. It's a very nice suggestion. Roger is in Hatfield. Hello, Roger. Good evening, Ian. Evening. And good evening, good evening, David. Good I evening. don't wish this to sound sycophantic, but it probably is going to, but I think a lot of people will agree with this. Isn't it about time we were addressing your guest as Sir David? because the gigantuan contribution that he's made to British broadcasting really shouldn't have gone unrewarded for so long. And I, when I think of some of the lesser contrib contributory mortals that have uh, had honours bestowed on them, I, I personally think that it's, uh, it's, it's something that the industry in which you both work in should be looking at before the gentleman gets uh, too many years uh, more on the clock. And my main, my main <laughs> question well <laughs> is with regard to uh, linking so two things ju together. Just before you um, go on, Roger, so does that mean I get an MBE or something? <laughs> well, you're, you're, you're a fine broadcaster as well in your own <laughs> Roger, writing, Roger, can I, can, I, can I answer the first part of your question before you go on to the certainly. second one? I've always 
believe that if you are a political interviewer, you should not accept honours that have to go through Number 10 Downing Street because even though it may not be uh, that you, you know, change your tone or whatever in order to get an honour, if you're given a knighthood, it makes you seem to be part of the very establishment that you've spent your life quizzing, cross-questioning, arguing with and all that. And I just think... Um, I, and when Robin Day got a knighthood, I said, told him he shouldn't have taken it. And I, and I wouldn't take a knighthood were it to be offered. So that's the well, short answer. OK, and I, and, and I respect uh, your view on that. Well, I think that uh, uh, the highest Sony Award, if you haven't already got it, should be awarded. Because you, you... So, Sony Awards are for radio and they don't exist anymore. No, I tell you, I did have a wonderful award. Um, uh, the, the one that's voted um, uh, when I stopped doing question time, I did have at the, at the O2 and that was, that was brilliant. Um, that was terrific, and I, I did get an award for a, a lifetime or something. Though it's... Well, it just, it just seems that someone of your standing and magnitude in the industry that you've spent your life in has got to the age that you are, and there isn't a sort of, you know, a big recognition, because, I mean, you know, there, there are awards handed out to people that really don't deserve them. Um, you, you, you've, you know, you've committed your... Your working life to providing you, your, uh, if I say that on the day of the royal um, of the Queen's uh, funeral, when your voice wasn't present until later on in the day, when it came on, it was like putting on a pair of comfy slippers. You are so <laughs> much a part of the British way of life, as was your father before you, and I just think that it's wrong. But, but, I but, but Roger, question, again, can I in just just yeah. and that's very very sweet of you to say all that. But you have to remember, I'm a jobbing broadcaster. Week in, week out, I've done broadcasting. It's what I love doing. I don't need a reward or accolade for that. It's, my, it's been my life because I've thrived on it. I've had the most wonderful experiences being a broadcaster, and I still hope to have some to come, even though I'm 84 in a week's time, I think. Um, like David Attenborough, I go on. But it's the, uh, the work doesn't need... Uh, it's very touching you say that, but it really doesn't need that kind of recognition. The recognition is in, in what you say about the programming. It's in the audiences. It's in people liking Question Time or liking listening to you doing, uh, you know, state occasions or whatever it is. That's the reward. That's the only reward you ask for. On that note, who do you think are the up-and-coming broadcasters of tomorrow? I know you um, recently um, cited Stacey Dooley as someone that you th thought was quite um, uh, quite good. Well, I, I, I'd hate to... I did, actually, yes. When I got that big award, I, I, I said Stacey Dooley was terrific. I think she is terrific. But I don't want to mark the cards. I think Ian Dale's doing quite oh, well, don't you? He's yeah. on the way up. I think at the age of 60, <laughs> you couldn't describe me as up-and-coming. <laughs> but there we are. But Thank you. <laughs> That's very nice, uh, Roger. Roger thank you very much. Um, Kerry says, what's the secret to staying awake through the night on these mammoth election specials? Um, there's no secret. Um, you don't go asleep when you're broadcasting. No. You've got lights and a camera it's looking at you. isn't it? You couldn't go to sleep. But um, a copious supply of Mars bars. And a uh, supply of Mars The main thing is, uh, uh, not, you know, how do you not go to the toilet? That's mm. the real one. And the, again, the answer is by some magic and adrenaline or whatever, I don't know, you are able to sit there for all those hours. Have you ever gone through an election night programme and just got a bit bored? Never. No. Never, ever, 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 ever. I think they're thrilling. I mean, it's just theatre, isn't it? It's lovely. It's great, great, great. It absolutely is. It's, it's the programmes I most enjoy, I must admit. Um, Julie in Kingsbury says, let's imagine David is hosting the next election coverage in 2024. Who does he think he'd be announcing as the winner? <laughs> Dangerous territory. Can't draw me on that. <laughs> <laughs> You're not the BBC anymore. I uh, even so. Okay. Uh, I mean, I do have a view about that, but I'm not going to give it. Um, well, I'll wait till the exit poll. All right. No, I, that's I, feeble. I, I, I won't do a Paxman on you. Andrew in Bolton says, "Does David think the BBC license fee will still exist in ten years' time?" Not in its present form. I hope is my answer because I think it's very unfair, and I think it's generally accepted now with people facing this winter, real poverty, uh, and all the arguments that are going on, that to make people pay £159 for having a television, even if they don't watch it, and risk, and risk being taken to the courts, is not a system that can sustain. I think we have to find a way of making the rich pay a bit more, poor pay less. Somehow it's got to be found. Nobody's yet found a way. They've got a committee looking at it. They're trying to change it. 
But I do believe that that's how the BBC has to be funded because it belongs to all of us and the fact we pay for it makes it ours. Uh, and and uh, that's, a, I think, a good system in principle, but it's very unfair the way it's done at the moment, and I think that needs to change. I can't imagine you have many regrets in your career, but you, you did, I think, try to be BBC chairman twice and director general once. Now, if you had done any of those, you couldn't have done the broadcasting that you've done since. Is that a regret at all? That, that, that's, uh, um, I'm, I'm very pleased I didn't get any of those jobs. My only regret is not having done Strictly Come Dancing five years ago when I was, think, I think I was asked. Still time. No, not now. It's too late. You just raised the possibility. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Anyway, Strictly's changed now. It's different. Um, and Helen says, David, you always appear very composed. Have you ever had to fight back tears? Yes. Oh, I have once, actually. And I'll tell you exactly when it was. It was during Diana's funeral, and the hearse taking her coffin was coming out of Kensington Palace and across towards Westminster. And I saw for the first time the wreath on top of the coffin and the words in white flowers, mm. which just said the one word, mummy, mummy. And I choked as I said, I just saw it and said it. And I actually had to hold back tears then. Yes, I was just so moved by it. Did you kick yourself afterwards? Because I think a lot of broadcasters who do tear up get embarrassed by it and think I, that I'm not there to emote, I'm there to report. And yet, I would say, no, no, you're, you're just reflecting what the audience is doing. Yes. No, I, I, I didn't kick myself for it, but it's not something I would want to do too often. I mean, I do all these very moving, you know, the Cenotaph in November, mm. for instance, which I'm doing again this year, which is a very deeply moving occasion with people, veterans of war, people injured, hideously injured and things. And it would be easy to over to be over emotional yourself mm. and i think it goes back to what we were saying earlier about commentary that i think the pictures tell the story and your job is just to identify uh, you know the, the people and what's happening and not to try and impose your own emotions however powerful they are on the person who's si sitting at home watching that's not what your job is you have done radio but clearly you love television and uh, I just think that they are, they are obviously two broadcasting mediums that have some sort of similarity because you're communicating with people. But I just think radio is so f superior to television in getting that connection with the individual listener. Well, I disagree. Thought you might. I disagree. i tell you why <laughs> I disagree, because I have a love for the television camera because when I, you, you're talking to a microphone, we're talking to microphones now. When I talk into a television camera, I'm not talking to a million people. I'm talking to one or two people. And very early on, I think probably from watching my father using the television mm. camera, I made the camera my friend. Mm. So to me, talking to a camera is a very intimate moment. It's, I don't feel I'm on parade. I don't feel... This is frightening. I don't feel uh, I, this is very sort of um, of, of official moment. I'm just talking to somebody down the camera. Literally, I used to think of one person, I won't say who, that I was talking to. And if ever I got into a sort of, oh, this is so grand or this is such a difficult moment or this is so dangerous or this is, you know, uh, this is so important, I just remember that it was just this one person sitting at the other side of that camera that I was talking to. So I disagree. I mean, radio is wonderful. I agree in the way we can talk like this, but we could do this on television just as easily. Well, we could because we are being filmed and this will go out on a Global Player on our YouTube channel. You never told me that. Well, there you are. You didn't warn me. There's I... no camera on me. There is. There's is one there? there. Oh, there, my goodness. There. Oh, my goodness. But you look great. Well, I should have. Just, I just finally, yes. um, what are you doing next? Because I hope we can see you do lots of television oh, documentaries. It's very kind of you. I don't know is the truth. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm hand to mouth is my existence. <laughs> I never believe a broadcaster when they say that. David Dimbleby, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. David's book is called Keep Talking, A Broadcasting Life. Uh, if you know anyone who's remotely interested in broadcasting in the media, you need to buy this book for them for Christmas. Simple as that. You're listening to LBC. I'm Ian Dale. It's three minutes past nine. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This 
is LBC. From Global's Newsroom, Donald Trump has been ordered to give evidence to the Congressional Committee investigating last year's attack on the U.S. Capitol. Five people were killed and hundreds injured in the January the 6th riot. The panel voted unanimously to subpoena the former president to appear. The motion was proposed by the committee's vice chairman, Republican Liz Cheney. Our duty today is to our country and our children and our Constitution. We are obligated to seek answers directly from the man who set this all in motion. And every American is entitled to those answers so we can act now to protect our republic. The Chancellor insists he'll still be in post in a month's time, despite reports number 10 could be on the verge of ditching parts of his mini-budget. Last month's announcement of tax cuts sparked turmoil in the financial markets and MPs are piling pressure on the Prime Minister to water down the plans. Chris Wilkins, who was Theresa May's chief speechwriter, says Kwasi Kwarteng is in a very tight spot. It's a really difficult moment for the Chancellor in particular. It was his plan, he presented it, and once the markets lose faith in in the individuals um, behind the policies as well as the policies themselves, then it's clearly a, a perilous moment. A man who shot 17 people dead at a high school in Florida in 2018 is to be sentenced to life in prison. 24-year-old Nicholas Cruz pleaded guilty to murdering 14 students and three staff members in the city of Parkland. The jury couldn't unanimously agree he should be executed. It's emerged a man with a knife who was shot dead by armed officers in Derby last week had already been tasered. The watchdog says the 35-year-old had also been tackled with a stun grenade and batter and rounds. Seven million people were waiting to start routine hospital treatment in England at the end of August. It's the highest figure since records began in 2007. Labour has called the situation totally unacceptable. Fresh rail strikes have been announced. The RMT union says members working as train managers on Avanti West Coast will walk out on October the 22nd and November the 6th in a row over rosters. In the city, the FTSE 100 closed up 24 points at 68.50. The pound buys $1.13 and €1.15. LBC weather tonight showers in the central and northern areas of the UK and a few in the south too. Tomorrow, mostly dry but cloudy with a chance of showers, a high of 17 degrees. From Global's Newsroom for LBC, I'm Andy Ivey. This is LBC from Global. Leading Britain's conversation with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening. Six minutes past nine. You see, that hour is why I love doing what I do. It's such an honour to present programmes that can include interviews with people like David Dimbleby, who I, I just think, I mean, somebody that I've grown up with, somebody that I've admired as a broadcaster from a teenager right until the current day. And, uh, well, I think you, could, you can all imagine how much that uh, meant to interview him. Right, we are now going to make a dramatic gear change now because we're going to talk about whether we should be returning ancient artefacts to...